Our mission, Helping Parents Heal, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background. Attendance today at this meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. However, these Zoom meetings are helpful to parents all around the world, and they are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members who are not able to attend this meeting live can also watch. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, Karen. Thank you for being here. Yes, welcome, Karen. We're so happy to have you. And I'll just read her very short bio. Karen Anderson is an award-winning animal communicator, pet loss, and afterlife specialist. She is a leading authority on the afterlife, having conducted thousands of consultations over the last two decades with departed souls. Her ability to obtain amazingly accurate evidential messages from the other side has brought about much needed healing to her clients across the globe. Karen's psychic abilities first appeared in childhood and became so accurate, they would later help her solve crimes during her law enforcement career. Karen has written two best-selling and award-winning books, The Amazing Afterlife of Animals and Hear All Creatures, and is a contributing author to The Secret Inner Life of Pets and Amazing Paranormal Encounters, Volume 2. She is also featured in the documentary, All Around Us, which follows the life story of a psychic medium. She offers private coaching for entrepreneurs who dream of pursuing their passion as an animal communicator. Please learn more about Karen by visiting her website, www.karenanderson.net and I will go ahead and put that in the chat box and without further ado please join me in welcoming Karen Anderson. Oh thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity and hello everyone it's nice to see all of your faces. I want to apologize for the dark camera angle here uh, for some reason my uh, Zoom light isn't working today, so <laughs> I'm a little bit in the dark here, so I apologize for that. But you look great, you... by the way. Just want to let you know, you look fabulous. Okay, good. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and wanting to find out more about our pets, what happens at the end of their life, and what happens after they leave their physical body. And I know as a pet parent myself, you know, we agonize over decisions that we make with our pets. And I'm going to help alleviate some of your, your worries and some of that um, anxiety that maybe you're holding on to that, you know, really doesn't serve you anymore. And boy, we play those loops in our head, don't we, over and over again. I know I do. It's like, oh, could I have done more? Should I have done more? You know, were they in pain? Did they struggle? All those things. I'm going to share with you insight on, first of all, my background, how I got started in this crazy line of work. And I'll share little stories of my favorite stories from actual communication sessions, just what the animals have shared with me about what happens at the end of their life and what they experience, because it's very different than what you and I think. It's very different. And I'll also share with you what happens when they leave their bodies, who greets them when they transition to the other side. Don't we all wanna know who are they with? What are they doing over there? You know, is there such thing as a rainbow bridge? We've all heard about the rainbow bridge. And uh, you know, some other questions too I'll touch on such as can they see us? Can they hear us? You know, and some of you may be wondering, do they come back? 
Do they reincarnate? And, uh, and I'll of course uh, answer your questions too. So I'm gonna share a little bit of everything with you tonight. And uh, this is my joy and my passion and it has been a 25 year journey for me that started many years ago. I could do this as a child. You know, most children are very intuitive. Um, but I didn't know that it was something different or unusual. I thought everyone could talk to the animals. Plus, get this, I lived 20 minutes away from Disneyland in Southern California. So we were there all the time. And if you think about it, every Disney movie, all the cartoon animals talk. So that's what I grew up with. So my favorite exhibit at Disneyland was the Tiki Room where all the birds would sing and the flowers would bloom in the tiki, 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 tiki room, right? So I'm so aging myself, but you know, that's what I grew up with and Bambi and you know, just all of those great characters, the jungle book and every animal could speak. So I never thought for a moment that my pets couldn't. So that's what I remember. My earliest memories was having silly little conversations with my childhood dog and my childhood cat, nothing to what I do, you know, at this level, but certainly, you know, I knew if they were happy, if they were sad and, and what was going on with them, which totally freaked out my parents. So they didn't know what to do with me. So they started to discourage me and tell me, you know, you shouldn't be saying those things and you need to stop talking to the dog. And then I started seeing my departed human family members that had passed away before I was born and I would describe them to my mom and dad that there was a you know a, a woman a, a lady that visited me at night or a man that visited me and I would describe them to a T and then my parents were like oh no <laughs> what do we what do we do we didn't know what to do so I learned at a very early age that I had to hide my abilities that it wasn't acceptable so I kind of pushed everything down. So I'm gonna fast forward now. Many decades later, I'm a police officer. I am in a little town in the mountains southwest of Denver called Bailey. And I am straight out of the academy, okay? They, it was an all male department. I was the only female officer. We're up at about 9,000 feet up there. So I'm working the, the graveyard shift. They decided right out of the academy, we're going to see if she's, you know, cut out for this. So we're going to put her on graveyards. So I start responding to calls. Now, this is a mountain district. Your nearest backup car could sometimes be 45 minutes away asleep at home. It's not like what you see on TV where, you know, 500 cop cars pull up on the scene. It wasn't like that at all. So I had to start responding to these calls by myself. And it was everything we had homicides, we had domestic violence, we had you know, drugs, we had, you know, all kinds, everything that you would have in a big city. So it was on one of these crime scenes that one of the resident animals told me where a suspect was hiding. Now, let me back up the bus a little. I had been refreshing my animal communication skills at home with my own pet. So I was really trying to reactivate everything had no idea that it was gonna flip flop over into my work as a police officer. So I'm minding my own business, taking a victim statement, when all of a sudden this little kitty comes diddy bopping out of the house, we were in the front yard, and walks over to a garden shed, looks, and of course I love cats, so I'm looking at this little, oh, look at the kitty, the victim was standing right next to me. We were, her, um, her husband had assaulted her, so he fled on foot. So I was taking her statement in front of the house. So this little kitty comes out, sits down right in front of the garden shed, looks me right in the eye, and in my head, I heard the word inside. And I thought, did I just hear that? How could he be in that shed? That shed had already been searched. There were two other officers on the scene. There's no way he could be in that shed. And I start second guessing, right? I start doubting, did I really hear that? Did that cat really say that? So I thought, you know what? I better act on this. So I, I took the victim away, made sure she was safe, tucked away safely. I came back around, drew my weapon, and I ordered the suspect to come out with their hands up. And sure enough, 
the garden shed opened up and out come these two hands. So that was my introduction to what animals are capable of telling us. And my mind went, and I thought, if they could tell me where the suspect is hiding, what else can they tell me? What else do they know? How far can I take this? So I was hook, line, and sinkered at that point. I was in it. I was going to learn everything I could about it. I threw myself into it, and I started practicing like crazy. So I got more messages from pets on crime scenes, and I will tell you, they are more reliable than human eyewitnesses because animals don't have agendas and animals don't lie. Well, let me rephrase that. Some cats lie, but most of the time, animals don't lie. <laughs> I love cats, don't get me wrong, but if someone's going to make a fool out of me, it's going to be a cat. And I have, I have more than three. That's all I'm going to confess to tonight because you can only see three of them at any one time. So that's all I'm going to admit to. So now I'm a police officer. I'm supposed to be credible. I'm supposed to be, you know, trustworthy and reliable. And I'm hearing animals talk to me on crime scenes. This, you know, how do you move forward with that? It's not like I could put in my police report. Well, my confidential informant has four legs and a tail, and they told me where the suspect was hiding. So it was really a challenge for me to kind of juggle all of this craziness that was going on in my life. But I was loving it at the same time. I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how far can we go? So that's how it all kind of got started for me. And um, I became completely engrossed in sharpening my skills. It is a skill to communicate with an animal or a departed human, just like any other skill, golf, piano, tennis, painting, singing. Now granted, some people are more naturally inclined to certain types of activities, but just like any other skill, anybody can learn how to do this. Obviously I learned how to do this, so anybody can learn how to do this. And I wasn't particularly psychic or intuitive. I was just a normal person. So um, that's how everything got rolling for me. And even though I didn't stay in law enforcement, I found that the animals on crime scenes could tell me detailed and specific information about not only who was guilty, where, you know, if, Sometimes when you arrive on a domestic violence scene, you don't know who, who hurt who, you know, because everybody's lying to you. So, you know, if there was a resident pet, you better believe I was going to check in with that pet to see if they could tell me anything or say anything. And more times than not, the animals were accurate in what they shared with me, which still kind of blows my mind. But so that's how this crazy journey got started. And I realized what my true calling was. I'd always loved animals. I'd always felt that I should be a veterinarian or maybe a trainer at SeaWorld, or you know, I should be working with wild animals somewhere. I just always felt like I should be aligned with animals somehow ever since I was a tiny kid, but I never my wildest dreams thought that this is where things would go. So I'm just as shocked as everyone else sitting there going, what just happened? So fast forward a little bit, as I began to get better at understanding them, and I wanna share with you that understanding them is just like understanding a departed human that sends a message to you. There is a process that you go through where the more you practice, the, the more likely you will understand what they're trying to say. I have to go through a meditation. I have to raise my vibration. Uh, there's a, a whole process I go through. It's not like bewitched where I can just wiggle my nose and then suddenly poof, information appears. Although I will say one time I was at my dentist office and I was looking at a picture on the wall of this big gigantic mastiff that the receptionist had on the wall. And I said, oh my gosh, he's beautiful. What's his name? And she says, oh, that's Tyler. And he's our baby and we love him so much. I said, oh my gosh, he's gorgeous. How much does he weigh? Oh, he's like 200 pounds. I thought, oh my gosh. As I was talking to her, she's typing away, putting my next appointment in. I heard this dog say, I'm sad because of my daddy not being home anymore. 
So I call you their moms and dads. It's just easier for me instead of trying to get names. So I thought, wow, this is really weird because I work off of a photo. That's how I connect. So I'm getting this message from this dog. Now I'm not just going to tell this total stranger. Um, by the way, your picture of your dog just started talking to me and is very unhappy that your husband isn't home as much anymore. But I wanted to validate what I heard. So I just asked her in a roundabout way, you know, oh, you know, what does your husband do? Oh, he's a firefighter. I said, oh, that's really exciting. She goes, yeah, but you know, he just got uh, hired full time. So now he's gone for like two weeks at a time. You know, it was just four days on and four days off. Now he's gone for like two weeks and it's really hard on all of us, especially the dog because they're like best buddies. So there was my validation, right? So without, you know, coming right out and asking her, you know, or telling her that her dog told me this. So this is what happens when you're an animal communicator. When you have the ability to hear them, and I'm mostly clear audience, meaning I hear their words, they know that, they sense that, and they will send you messages, sometimes to get your attention, sometimes to let their mom or dad know that something is up. Sometimes they're just bored and lonely and they just want attention and they just wanna say hi. So, and it has its downsides, I wanna tell you. Such as, I went to the shelter with my mom because she wanted to adopt a new kitty and that was too much for me, I had to leave. So it does have its downsides. And I did try to go to a zoo one time only so that I could practice with like lions and tigers and all of that. I couldn't handle it. It was just too sad and overwhelming. And so it, there, there's good sides to it and there's some not so good sides to it. But, okay, so let's talk about your pets. So the number one thing the number, mo number one most common concern I hear from my clients is that they want to make sure, they want to know that their departed pet is happy, balanced, doing good, and most of all, number one, do they forgive them for all of their shortcomings? for euthanizing? Do they forgive them for not giving them the pill every day that they were supposed to? Do they forgive them for not doing the treatment? Do they forgive them for not paying attention when they noticed that they were getting sick and they didn't take them to the vet right away? We as pet parents, we do our best, right? We really try to look out for these guys, but sometimes life gets in the way and we think it's just a fluky thing and we overlook certain things. So this is the number one concern I would hear from grieving pet parents is that they wanted to know that their babies on the other side still love them. You know, do they forgive me? And I've been doing this now for 25 years. I have logged over 22,000 pet communication sessions and human communication sessions combined. As of today, not a single animal has ever come through and told me that they were upset with their mom or their dad for anything that happened, even when we are directly involved somehow accidentally or otherwise with their demise. So I want you to think about that for a minute. Just think about that. 22,000 sessions, not a single time did an animal come through and say, you know, I blame my mom, I blame my dad, you know, I should still be there. No, it's not like that. What I hear is I'm worried about my mom. I'm worried about my dad. They're so sad. Every time they think of me, they cry. You know, why do they cry when they think of me? I want them to be happy. I want them to live their life. I want them to be joyful because, and here's the big ta-da, when you live joyfully, your departed pets, your living pets, your departed human loved ones, 
benefit from that joy. It emanates from you like, like you were a giant um, battery pack filled with this loving energy. And when you live in your joy, when you're happy and balanced and smiling and, and enjoying your life, it's like spiritual fuel to them. It's like they just got their tank topped off and it's, it's exhilarating to them. Now think about this. The flip side to that coin is, and I'm guilty, so I'm speaking from experience here. When we agonize over a loss, when things didn't go the way we had hoped, when it was unexpected, when there's an accident, whatever happens and we lose our beloved companion animals, we play a loop over and over in our minds. And we play that coulda, shoulda, woulda game. And if only I had this, or if only I had done that, or whatever it is, we actually drain them of energy. It brings them down. It doesn't hurt them, doesn't stop them from their spiritual journey, but it would be like they were a balloon and you're slowly letting the air out. So think about that. They don't understand grief because they don't grieve when they leave their bodies. They experience joy and exhilaration and incredible deep, deep love. And so they're in this beautiful space, like this warm, inviting, when you feel it, you don't wanna leave it. It's like, I wanna go there and I wanna stay there, wherever they are, which is all around us, by the way, it's not in some faraway place. But when you feel that joy, when you feel what they're feeling, and then they look at us, and we're grieving and we're agonizing and we're playing those tapes over in our head. It's like, wah, wah. they don't get it. They don't understand. They don't understand our grief. They don't understand why every time we think about them, we get sad. And it, it makes them on certain levels feel bad. Like they're causing our pain. So I, does that make sense? Are you guys like, okay, some of you are shaking your heads. So. My biggest epiphany, my biggest light bulb moment as a pet parent was I used to be that person. I used to agonize, I used to, you know, horribly grieve and beat myself up and punish myself relentlessly if I missed something or if, you know, whatever, I felt I should have been a better mom to my pets. And when I finally heard, was able to hear from them, their perspective, they don't even bring it up. What you're agonizing about in your mind or in your thoughts or what you, you know, worry about, it never even comes through during a session. They talk about the happy times, the joyful times. They talk about things they did to make you laugh, to make you smile. They talk about, you know, how beautiful it is where they are and that they're around you all the time because the afterlife, the other side is right here. It's all around us. It's down by your feet. It's around you on your bed. It's in their favorite place. It is right here around you, wherever you are. So if you move across the country, across the globe, guess what? That's where they are because they are coded. Their soul is coded to you, just like those little you know, codes when you go to the grocery store and they scan them. You guys are coded, so you're connected for eternity. So there's no way you're getting rid of them. <laughs> they are yours for eternity. They will find you wherever you are. They will be with you all the time. Well, not all the time. So that's the other question. Are they with me all the time? No, they go off and play sometimes. But think about this. When you are an energy form, you don't have a body, you're just pure energy. You can be in more than one place at one time. So like you and I, we can only be here or we can only be at the grocery store. Or we can only be at the beach or the mountains. They can go wherever they want. It can be in multiple places at one time. So that was kind of a mind blowing moment for me when I started to hear this and not just from my animals, but from the clients that I was working with from their pets too. They were telling me the same thing. And that's what would happen. I would begin to hear the same things over and over again that the animals were sharing, you know, as soon as they left their body, as soon as they exited physical form, it was like launching. 
and they were in this beautiful exhilaration of joy. They were immediately surrounded. They were never lost. They were never scared. They were never alone. They were immediately surrounded with love, loved ones, departed human loved ones, departed animal loved ones, companion animals. There are even some pets on the other side that their specific task, if you will, is to greet animals that don't have a home, you know, like all the shelter animals that pass away. There are animals there and people there to greet them. So everybody is greeted, everybody is welcomed. It is just incredibly joyful. So as you're going about your day and you're thinking about your pet, I want you to keep in mind, they can hear you just like you can hear me right now. They can see you. you. You look to them like a beaming, glowing light of love. They have a memory card of what you look like, but as an, as an energetic being, you just look like a glowing, bright, beautiful, loving light to them. And so they can hear you. So when you talk to them and say their name, they love it. So keep saying their names. And another question I hear all the time, will they come back? Will they reincarnate? Maybe, <laughs> sometimes, not often, but it happens. And here's the thing. If they do decide to come back, you have to remember they're going to be different than what they were the last time they were alive because they're in a new body, it's a new experience, and they're not gonna be exactly the way they were. That's called cloning. So reincarnation is a little bit different. There's an essence of them. Like if you sprinkle salt, you know, if you like it really salty, you put a lot of salt in there. Sometimes there's a lot of essence of that animal in there. And sometimes there's just a little sprinkling of the essence of that animal. You might only see one or two things that they do that remind you of them when they were here the last time. And then they may never do it again. I've seen all kinds of things and I've heard all different kinds of experiences, but most pets don't have the need to come back because their, their journey with us was so complete and so perfect and so beautiful, they don't feel the need to come back, but some do. And I've also heard even more rare is the occurrence where they will come back as a different animal, like a cat coming back as a dog, or even coming back as a human. And my theory is, and I'm not an expert on reincarnation, I'm just an expert on the messages I've received over the past 25 years is that there are no rule books. So anything can happen. If it's in the highest and best for that particular soul, for the growth of that soul to come back as human or a different animal species, then that's what they do. So those are some of the big questions that I get some of the most popular um, topics, I guess, that uh, my clients want to know and, and are asking me. But I think that the big takeaway here is they want us to be happy. They want us to live our lives fully. They, they will understand that you're grieving. They will understand that for a little while, but to keep it going, it starts to make them feel bad that every time you think of them, you cry, or every time you think of them, you, you become sad. So I hope that makes sense. I'm looking at the clock, watching the time. So how am I doing? You're doing fabulous, uh, fabulous work right now. And everybody loves what you're saying. We do have a lot of questions. Do okay. you mind maybe answering some questions? And they're all very good. Um, mm -hmm. First question. Um, can our living dog see our dog that has passed away? Yes, you'll see them staring up at the ceiling or looking down the hallway or maybe staring at, you know, something that's not even there. I just posted on my Facebook page, uh, somebody captured a cat playing with something you can't see. So if you want to check it out, go to my main Facebook page. And, um, and it's a perfect example. Yes, they have that ability to see spirits that our, uh, our eyes can't pick up. They can hear them too. Sometimes they don't know what it is. So they'll bark or freak out because they don't always know what it is, but sometimes they do. Every pet is different. Every animal is unique. Every situation is unique. That's beautiful. Um, 
It's interesting. Sherry's asking because of the fact that you did say that sometimes animals uh, incar uh, reincarnate into humans. Do humans sometimes reincarnate into animals? It's rare. It's really, really rare. But yeah, I think it can happen. I'm sorry I have these weird shadows coming <laughs> on my face. I have like Rudolph here. I have a little spot on the end of my <laughs> on my nose. Um, so to answer your question, it's rare. Can it happen? Absolutely. There's no rule book out there. There's not like a checklist. Well, are you human? You have to come back as human. If you're dog, you have to come back as dog. I think anything is possible. There's so much we don't know. There's so much I don't know. There's so much I haven't even tapped into yet. I've just barely scratched the surface and look how long I've been doing this. It makes you want to know more, right? I mean, once you get certain answers, you're like, ooh, I got to find out more about that. Wow. So Martina is asking, do you ever hear from animals other than pets, like farm animals, pigs, and cows? Yes. And again, good and bad experiences. I'm surrounded here. I live in Eastern Washington. I'm on 30 acres of farmland. I have cows, sheep, goats, wild turkeys, uh, deer. We have some uh, cougars. There's all kinds of wildlife here. And yes, I do get messages from them, but I will tell you that the majority of my work is with companion animals. I mean, that's where the bulk of my work is because that's what my clients want. But I've worked with horses, I've worked with uh, cattle, I've worked with some exotic animals. Uh, the craziest, most exotic one I ever communicated with was a pangolin. Do you know what a pangolin is? It's like wow. from Australia or somewhere down there. Pangolin, it's, yes. It's got like scales all over it and it's endangered. And so this one was in a rescue because it had been hit by a car. And so I was checking in with it to see, you know, what it needed. And, um, and that was really interesting because they completely unlike cats and dogs, you know, the normal domesticated animals, you get some completely weird and interesting messages. Like one time, oh, get this. One time I had a snake. This was a pet snake, but still I was holding this snake. I love snakes. Um, and some of you are like, oh, but I love them. And so I was holding the snake and she looked right at me with one eye and she said, what is this thing you humans call fear? Wow. Now how do you answer that and not sound like a total fool? Well, so when you answer, do you answer with your voice or with no, your in mind? My head. It's in my head. So they've, I'm mainly clear audient, meaning I hear them, I hear their voice, but that's how I train myself. But they'll also send me a picture, an image. I'll get a feeling like if, uh, when I first open a session, I get this feeling of love. So when the client gets on the phone with me, I feel like I love the client. I feel like deeply in love with the client. <laughs> it's like, I love you because <laughs> there's so much love coming through. But also I fear, I feel their anxiety. I feel their stress. I feel everything else. So it's kind of a little bit of everything. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, it, we have a question asking, what do our pets see or feel when they cross over? So you talked about the Rainbow Bridge. I know that you said that they're welcomed by lots of people. We hope to hear you say that they're welcomed by our kids, obviously. Yes. yes. But it's okay, like your, your soul group is what it is. I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I okay, so we all have a soul group. So everyone you have come in contact with that you spend time with doesn't have to be family, but usually it's close family members. This is your soul group. So a soul group could include your first grade teacher. You know, there are lessons there that we learn from all of these people that we experience throughout our lifetimes. But usually our soul group is our core family members, adopted children, same thing as living as birth child, same, same soul group. You're meant to be together. That's purposeful. It's meant to be together. The soul group, the soul family, your soul family is the first ones there to greet your pet. So it's literally going from your arms into their arms. So think of it as like passing this beautiful bundle to your loved ones on the other side. Now, the interesting thing is I hear this sometimes, well, you know, 
I'll say, you know, your mom's here. I'm connecting with your mom on the other side. And she's showing me that she was there to greet, you know, your kitty when your kitty passed. And, and someone would say, my mom hated cats. My mom hated that cat. And she won't want anything to do with that cat. <laughs> and go, I don't know what to tell you. I can only tell you what I'm seeing. And I'm seeing her with your cat. So whether they like them while they were here or not doesn't seem to matter all of that kind of melts away and they get past that when they transition to the other side well that's beautiful everything is love over there anyway so it makes sense that they would love each other even yes. if she didn't like cats here she probably <laughs> loves them now and especially if the cat belongs to the, her loved one here so People are saying what wonderful work. Um, there are also people asking about whether or not you do remote readings, but I, I think right here, it would be good to just explain, uh, maybe you could just explain about what you do do right now. Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> I have uh, conducted private sessions for the past 24 years. I retired last year. I can't believe I'm saying that out loud. I retired from doing sessions last year. How does that happen? Anyway, um, I decided, and it came to um, me through meditations with my spirit team, my spirit guides that helped me, that I had done what I needed to do in private sessions, and now I needed to pay it forward and pass the torch along to others who are following in my footsteps. So I'm taking all of my knowledge, all of my experience, all of everything I've been through, including my failures, and I coach people who want to learn how to communicate or who want to open a business doing energy work or energy healing or animal communication, whatever it is that they want to do. And also my biggest focus right now is writing. I've written two books to document my journey Hear All Creatures and The Amazing Afterlife of Animals. And those books are bestsellers and they're going out into the world and they're helping people heal from a very, very dark place. So I feel like I can reach more people by writing more books. So I'm actually writing my third book right now. It's called Pet Loss, Hope and Healing, which is actually the same name as my mobile app, which is called Pet Loss, Hope and Healing. You can download it free. Just go to the app store and search it or go to my website. And this to me is more important for me to keep writing because I can hold one session with you and that would take up a, about an hour of my day or I can write a book, another book, and I can get that book on Amazon and sell it to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So that's why I'm not doing private sessions anymore. And I just feel that this is really important for me to be able to keep the legacy going and pass this along and help others that are in that really dark place that have lost, maybe they've suffered a lot of losses in the past. And I wanna help those people. So by um, I provide on my website, if you go to karenanderson.net, you'll see an opt-in button. It's a big pink button. It says get VIP access. That will provide you with ongoing pet loss support. There are free book offers in there. Yes, I give my books away free. I know that's crazy, but I do. There's free book offers in there. There's $1.99 ebook offers. There's discounts off of my beginners online animal communication course where you get to work directly with me. So this is my focus right now, and this is my passion. And um, I am going to be sharing so many stories of actual sessions in the next book, which is in the my most recent book, The Amazing Afterlife of Animals. That's what everybody loved. They loved the stories. They wanted to hear more. And so that's why I'm not doing private sessions anymore. That's perfect. Thank you for explaining that. And I, I want to ask you something that Antoinette is asking. I love it because this is something that I think we all need to know. Um, Antoinette is saying, can you give my kitten a talking to that he cannot go outside because it's too, too dangerous for him? Can Antoinette do that herself, Karen? Yeah. Is this I'll something? I will tell you exactly how to do it. Okay. Animals don't understand. Don't. So what they understand is when you think of something like don't go outside, you can't go outside, what are you picturing outside? 
<laughs> you just sent the wrong message to your pet. So what you have to say and what you have the message you have to have in your head, everything has to be in alignment. Your thought, your vision, your words, and your feelings all have to be in alignment. We as humans are the most confusing thing to our pets because we say one thing, we do something else, we're thinking something else. That's why there's behavior problems because our pets are like, oh my God, would she just make up her mind? So don't say don't. Instead, you have to say what you want. What does the end result look like? If you want Kitty to be happy in the house, then you have to picture Kitty being happy in the house. If you want Kitty in the litter box, you have to picture kitty in the litter box. If you want two animals to stop fighting, you have to picture them in your mind, getting along, ignoring each other, everybody happy, cozy, whatever. Everything has to be in alignment. This is what you can do right now at home. And it doesn't take any skill. You just make sure you're in alignment. Make sure you are holding that perfect image of what you want to happen loud and clear and then everyone else in the house has to be on the same page because if you're doing it and the next person there isn't sorry all bets are off so everybody has to play this game and it is a game it's a little bit of a game it's kind of like charades a little bit is it um is there a point where where our animals our, our fur babies are too old to be able to be taught new tricks or is it something that can always happen I think just like us, I think we get set in our ways. And what I would tell my clients is whatever behavior is happening that's inappropriate, it's probably your fault. <laughs> and, and let me let me qualify that. Because of what I just told you, you were probably thinking what you didn't want them to do. Oh my gosh, I hope they stop fighting. Oh, I hope they don't eat the blinds. Oh, I hope they stay off the counter. I hope, and you're picturing exactly what you don't want. So my theory is this, you know, it's the behavior didn't happen overnight. It's not going to disappear overnight, but you can make it progressively better by applying what I just told you and being very aware of you not being in alignment and every other person in the house not being in alignment. Well, good. So um, this question is the follow-up question. Can anyone become an animal communicator if, for instance, they work with you? Is that possible? Uh, or does it really take someone special? If I can do this? Well, you know, here again, I don't think my dad could do this. My dad would be like, <laughs> You go psychoanalyze those animals, you know? So, okay, so my dad can't do this. God, you know, God bless him. He's, he's great, I love him. But, so I think some people because of their, maybe their upbringing or their belief system or their thought processes, you know, we are our biggest obstacle. We get in our own way. If like when you're a kid, you know how you had this great imagination, you can make anything happen. You know, you could fly, you could be, you know, riding horses, you could be underwater, you could be swimming with the dolphins. If we would allow ourselves to go back there and just believe that we can do all those things in our minds, that's what animal communication is. It's so similar to an imagination or thinking a thought. It's so similar that it actually takes practice to be able to differentiate the two. So when you think, well, I think I got a message, but I think that was just my imagination. No, that's a message. If you weren't thinking that, whatever it was, that is a message. So there's so it's the same part of the brain. So to answer the question, can anyone almost, almost? Um, okay, good. Um, Kay is asking, can our fur babies send us signs that they're around us? All the time. And let me share this with you. They don't have a body, neither do our human loved ones. So they're pure energy. So if any of you have seen the movie Ghost, the main character, Patrick Swayze, it took him forever to learn how to kick a can because he didn't have a body. He had to learn how to build up that energy and, and focus it to finally kick that can or to move that penny, you know, that scene where he pushes the penny under the door. So our departed loved ones 
are the same. They don't have a body. So what do they have to do? They have to manipulate something around us to let us know they're there. They do this by number one, coming to us in dreams. Number two, making something appear like a feather, um, maybe a bird, maybe a, a butterfly. Uh, some of my clients get coins. I have one client, she finds 11 cents wherever she goes. It's always a dime and a penny, always a dime and a penny. Her um, beautiful Great Dane named Cooper passed away on 11, 11, 11. Oh my gosh, and, how beautiful. You know, if you look for the signs, clouds, we get messages, clouds, rainbows, um, goosebumps. If you get a feeling like there's a strand of hair on, on you or, or going past you and you look and there's nothing there, I mean, how many of you had that happen where you're like, what the heck was that? Or something brush up against you and you look down and there's nothing there, that's them. They're letting you know. I've had dogs drop a ball like in my lap that want to play, like like a an imaginary ball. They'll drop it in my lap and be like, "Come on, I want to play. Want to play? Anything can be a message. Hearing their name, seeing a license plate, seeing a billboard, a T-shirt that has something on, a song pops up on the radio. They're manipulating your environment. Now, here's the caveat to that." If you disregard their message after they've built up all that energy to send it to you, guess what happens? They get frustrated and they won't send as many messages or they'll stop sending messages because you're not acknowledging them. On the flip side of that coin, if you make a big deal out of it and go, Oh my God, I just got a feather from you. I know that was you. Do it again. Do it again. I love it when you do that and you encourage them and you get excited and pay attention, guess what? You're gonna get more messages. Now, not every pet will send a message or a sign. And let me explain why. It has nothing to do with lack of love. I'm gonna repeat that. It has nothing to do with lack of love. It has everything to do with personal style. Some pets just don't feel the need or the ones that are with us the most don't feel like they have to send a sign because they're around us. And remember, their routine doesn't change. They're still doing the same things. They're still hanging out in the same places. They're still doing following you or they follow you. So nothing really changes for them. So they don't feel like they have to let you know they're there because they're always there. So that's what I've come to find out. And it's every animal is different. So don't get your feelings hurt. If you're still waiting for a sign for someone, just keep inviting them and encouraging them to do that. And I'll give you some little hints on how you can kind of boost your chances of getting a sign. First of all, you have to believe that they're gonna send you a sign. Next of all, you have to give them some source of fuel. So what is a source of fuel? Well. For me, in this line of work, uh, crystals, quartz, very powerful. They hold energy. Spirits can pull the energy out of certain objects and use that to, as fuel to manifest or move something or leave a sign or a feather or whatever to let you know that they're around. I have a set of um, wind chimes in my office off camera in a corner that doesn't get a draft, it's not near a window, but I let my loved ones know that they can move the chimes to let me know that they're there. So when I hear the chimes, it's like, oh, I've got a visitor. You can also do, and this is my secret weapon, okay? I don't have it in here, so it's off camera, so I'm just gonna have to tell you. My secret, secret weapon, when I was conducting sessions, I would make sure I had a gigantic, pack of batteries sitting on my desk like a you know 100 pack <laughs> giant pack of batteries why the obvious it's pure energy so i would tell those animals that i was connecting with or the departed humans whoever i was connecting with pull your energy from these batteries and send me more messages and guess what they did so 
if you don't give them a source of fuel, they're going to have to, you know, go to your electronic equipment. They're going to have to wait for the perfect storm or, you know, give them something that they can draw from and tell them, pull your energy from this, pull your energy from here, pull your energy from here. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this. Now you can send me a sign. And then you have to please acknowledge that you got a sign. If you don't acknowledge or you discount it or say, oh, I'm, it's, I must be crazy and it's my imagination. It's like stomping on their little feelings. So don't do that. Well, I think there's going to be a rush on buying batteries. Right. <laughs> Not only for our our beloved fur babies, but for our kids. It sounds yes, like they work yes. well. So how exciting to know that. I want to say that uh, Kay, who asked the question, said, I see pictures of border collies everywhere in stores, and I started seeing them on the beach after our border collie passed. And I want to say very quickly that um, when I guess our last puppy passed, um, we've had a lot throughout our married life, but I would feel him jump up on the bed all the time at the end of the bed. And I'd look to see, and he wouldn't be there, but I always knew that he was still sleeping there. So um, it's, it really is reassuring to hear. And the wind chime thing is such a great idea with no right. wind. And the crystals as well. Are there any crystals that animals like particularly more than others? You know, quartz is always uh, the go-to for me. I love amethyst. Uh, that's really powerful. Any kind of rose quartz, um, you know, those are all my go-tos. I have them in my office. And if you don't know anything about crystals, you, there's, there's stuff you got to do. You got to charge it. You got to clear it. You got to, you know, make sure you're doing it right. So don't just willy-nilly run to the store and grab a quartz because Karen Anderson said so. And now they stick it in the middle of the coffee table and go, okay, send me a sign. This is not gonna, it's not gonna work like that. No, there's a process. You gotta clear the crystal, you gotta clean it, you gotta, you know, follow this little process. And you can Google it, it's it's out there. So well, I also recommend that you encourage that pet by name. So what I mean is tell them, you know, I love you, I miss you, I would love to get a sign from you, say their name. And see, I would love it if you would send me a really big, obvious sign. Let it be really big. And then just stay open and pay attention. And I've heard of everything. I've heard robins showing up, cardinals showing up, um, footprints, like one paw print in the middle of the snow on a step where there's no other footprints, just one. I've heard of whiskers showing up, tufts of fur showing up. The indentation on a bed uh, where, the, where that particular uh, companion animal would sleep. Um, things moving uh, off the nightstand, lights turning on and off. We all have heard about flickering lights, right? That's a real common way that they'll flicker those lights to let you know that they're around. And it's for them, it's like it's like Christmas when you acknowledge it. They're, they go, ooh! They get so excited and then they want to do more. So the more excited you get, the more excited they get. And again, don't get your feelings hurt if you're not getting any signs. It just means that your baby is with you and they don't feel the need to do that. But you can still encourage them and invite them and get those things, place them around your house. That's a great way to open up that communication. But please be very specific who you want to hear from. Well, um, also Kit is saying, when the phone lights, TV flicker, is that our loved ones gathering energy too? I know you're saying that they're around, but is it because perhaps they're using that energy to try to send us a sign, which- um... Right, so my background is a paranormal investigator. And when I would go on an investigation, you always made sure you had extra batteries on you and you put fresh batteries in your camera, fresh batteries in your flashlight, fresh batteries in your digital voice recorder. And when I would walk, walk into a highly active, paranormally active location, you could literally watch the battery level drop. And that's just walking in. And we would get the burst of EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. As soon as we walked in, we get a burst of activity, a burst of lights, orbs, all kinds of things happening. And then it would die down again. Why? Because as soon as we walked in, they were pulling 
from all of our batteries and now they have the energy to do something. So they did, and then it, they pull back again and then they have to wait for the next round of energy. And some of us allow our energy fields to stay open all the time. Don't do that. You don't want that open all the time and they'll keep pulling your energy. So if you're always fatigued, if you always have headaches, if you're always dehydrated, if you're in a funk and you just don't know what the heck's going on with you, you probably have big holes in your energy field and you're getting all of that energy drained from you. And it's, you know, it's not gonna hurt you, hurt you, but you'll just feel kind of out of sorts and, and tired all the time. So if, if that's pinging in your ear and you're like, oh yeah, that's what's happening to me. You know, definitely look into that because you, you and I, we're, we're fuel, we're, we're energy, we're a source of energy for them and they'll pull from us. They don't mean to harm us, of course, but they'll pull from us in our electronic equipment and, you know, cell phones and whatever, TVs, computers, all of that stuff. Well, I think that's really amazing. And I just have to tell you an experience at our first Helping Parents Heal conference with 500 parents there. Carl Fink, who was the person who did the streaming video, was constantly complaining that his batteries were going completely dead, as well as Tony um, Allen, who was filming for us, his batteries just kept going dead. And they knew that it was because of the fact that the kids were there, yes. but it was a little frustrating. They had to make sure to stock up beforehand every day. So I think that's just so interesting that you're saying the same thing. Uh, Sherry's saying, and maybe this could be our last question. If you have a hole in your energy, how do we fix it? Do you have any um yeah. And, you know, I'm going to just flip back to remember I told you my, uh, my zoom light isn't working. Mm -hmm. It has worked every day since I've gotten it, except for today. It's still okay. not working. There's too so, many kids here and too many. So I'm, I'm sitting here in the dark because all of your kids are <laughs> taking the energy out of my, my office, which is fine. They can have it, but, um, they're probably very excited to be here. And they're probably very excited that you're learning more about this because now you're going to be listening more and paying attention more to how they can communicate with you and they can communicate through pets. So keep that in mind. And to answer the question about how do you heal and seal your energy leaks, it's very much like um, if you've ever frosted a cake or seen someone frost a cake, it's that same type of motion. You just have to imagine that you're covering up all of your energy all around you. Imagine a bubble all around you and picture, you know, if you're getting headaches and you probably have something up here that's open. So you just want to say a meditation. You want to surround yourself in prayer. And, and I have, if you opt in on my homepage, you'll get a free animal communication handbook. There's a meditation in there that can show you exactly how to do that properly so that you know, there's a right way to do things and there's not right way to do things. So, and then you just like, Frost the cake, you frost it. You just pull over all where you feel like you're out of sorts or whatever. And, um, and it's, it's your intention. You have to believe it up here. It's up here more than anything. If, if you don't believe it, if you're not buying it, it's not gonna work for you. So your intention is everything. And animal communication, 99% of it is intention. You have to believe you can do it. You have to believe that they can communicate with you. Can I tell you one quick story? Yes, of course you can. Okay. I'm gonna squeeze this in really fast. So I had a client one time who contacted me to communicate with her departed cat. And this was a stray that she had taken in and she was on her way to work one day and she was rushing and she backed out of the garage and she accidentally hit the cat. And he didn't die from that, but he later died from the injuries he sustained from that. So of course she was devastated as you can imagine. And so I was helping her through that and delivering messages to her. And um, he was very, very sweet and loving and grateful and thanked her. And he had all these beautiful messages, very specific messages, like mind blowing messages. But this one kind of took my breath away. He kept saying to me, talk about the amputated leg. Well, I don't wanna talk about that, right? So I didn't say anything. Well, he said it three times and I have a rule. If an animal tells me something three times, I have to say it, that's my rule. 
So I finally said to her, uh, I'm so sorry. I know this is a really such a sensitive subject. Just I apologize ahead of time, but he wants me to talk about the amputated leg. I'm so sorry. Did he lose a leg in this when you ran over him? Because I didn't know. All I had was a picture of his face. And all of a sudden there was dead silence on the phone and she started sobbing like <gasps> like she couldn't get her breath and I thought oh god Karen you idiot look what you've done and I just all of a sudden this wash came over me like oh I just made a bad situation worse and oh how could I do this and I'm horrible she's and I so I started pausing she's like no 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 Karen no no you don't understand and I said no I I don't understand she said it wasn't him that lost a leg. She said, three months after he passed away, I was in a horrible car accident and my right leg was amputated. Oh my goodness. Oh. So he was with her when it happened. He was more concerned about her oh. and her accident and her amputated leg than he was about anything she had done to him. I know. That's beautiful. That's very beautiful. That's why I do the work I do because think of how she was able to move from that very dark place, how she was able to move forward because of that one message and I almost didn't deliver it. Oh, well, yes. I'm so glad that you were able to do that. And I'm so grateful that you were able to speak to us this evening. Thank you so much for coming. And um, before we go, first of all, I'll make sure that I have all the information about her website and all of the different resources that are available on the YouTube video. But before we go, we always ask everyone to unmute themselves and say thank you and goodbye. And thank so if you'd like to go ahead. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day and I'll see you guys. We'll all see you uh, next week.